Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first episode of Retuning Your Firm. This is Richard Chaplin of the Managing Partners Forum, and I had a big toss up. Do I make this episode one or episode 16? And I thought, no, let's make it episode one. Let's start somewhere new and fresh. Let's think about what does retuning really mean? The pit stop analogy comes from Professor Scott of the London Business School. And I like it in many ways because it's what it's saying is that, yeah, you could just cover your car with a tarpaulin and wait for the rain to pass and maybe then go out on the circuit and maybe then not achieve what you wanted to. But actually, why don't you use that time efficiently? Why don't you retune everything? And of course, we're not really just talking there about the car. We're also talking about the leader because every car needs a driver. And we're also talking about the pit stop crew because unless they get their act together, your car won't get very far. So whilst I can pursue the analogy too far and won't, I think it's a really good way to think about what is really at the end of the day strategic planning. I mean, that's really what we're talking about here, I think, is how do you, now that you're beginning to feel that you understand what new normal might feel and look like, how do you actually then retune your firm to make it the best it possibly can be? Perfection is obviously an illusion, so it's an, it's an ongoing process. You're going to tinker here, you're going to tinker there. It's a bit like a piano. It will go out of tune, so you've just got to keep it in tune. So how do you do that? So what we're going to do today is, first of all, just share a few thoughts. Uh, you may have seen the slide before, seven strategies for retuning your firm. Um, so again, think big. Do you have to be able to think, as Lewis Carroll said, believe six impossible things before breakfast? You have to remember that it's all about relationships. That's client relationships. And then today we'll be talking a lot about internal relationships between you and your people and your partners. And remember to absolutely reciprocate the favors. People remember, don't remember what you did. They absolutely remember how you made them feel. Think small, focus on things that are gonna resonate, particularly with clients. You know, being a consortium is great at one level, but it doesn't really resonate very clearly. So think small, think about campaigns. Uh, think about key issues that are really important to you and actually take them to your clients, take them to the people who matter and really convert that audience into a community. Be willing to go for new ideas and services. Some firms are having completely rethinking others. No, we're not going to change. And that's fine. But actually be think, be willing to go for it. Speed is of the essence. This is lean start and we'll be going into this for sure at various times. So articulate and market test your assumptions. Accountants love assumptions. They're very valuable. You change your assumptions, you can change your profit. It's not complicated. But think about your assumptions. And if they prove invalid, and some will, and don't pretend they won't, amend them and then pivot in a new direction. And we're sort of pivoting in a new direction today, we think, and that's just quite nice. Be entrepreneurial. Keep listening and innovating. And as everybody knows, my key word on that sentence now is listening. Are you listening? Because if you're not listening, how are you making sure that you're delivering to your clients what they want? So that's really important. And thank you to Elena Kudzko of Globsec for those interesting insights. So who's on today's panel? Uh, welcome back, Marion. Marion uh, has been three, four times on the show and he is director of Tongue in Trees. I think last time he was on about six weeks ago. So that's interesting to hear sort of his video diary, what he's been up to. Uh, as I said, he won't be talking about his guitar or learning new chords, so I've done it for him. Um, <clears throat> Louise Sunderland is the director of programs of Be The Business. They've just launched a really interesting uh, campaign called Rebuild, which absolutely encourage you to go and check out on their website, looking at how can we be the business, but everybody who works with Be The Business, and that's a really great group of people. How can we help the SMEs actually navigate through this really tough time that they're now facing? Uh, and this weekend is a bit of a crunch point at some stages in testing demand, but I think it's a lot more to it than that. So really looking forward to Louise and her five minutes talking about that, and that follows Marion. Uh, Nigel, Nigel Spencer, he gave us a really interesting here from experts a couple of days ago, looking at learning and development. He was the former learning director, excuse me, former L&D director for two major law firms uh, before his current role at Said, and very much is sort of somebody who really understands the L&D world. And I think at times professional firms don't really understand their L&D experts. They think they're just there for training courses. And as Nigel will explain, there's a wee bit more to their role than that if it's done properly. Jonathan is coming to talk to us about the, um, I think it's the coronavirus stone, I think was the term he used, but I'm not totally familiar with it. But anyway, this notion that firms tuned mean that you have the right number of people at each level and you will have a bulge possibly of partners coming to the end. You then may have some pressure on the 
associates, uh, but you've actually got to have the right people at the right level to meet client needs. So how are you doing that? And obviously the career partnership very much focus in that area. Francesca, I suspect needs no introduction, but for those who haven't been on the show before, uh, she's the global lead of network capabilities. The point person I would call her within the whole of the GT network, that's probably nothing going on that she's not aware of. Um, and she always brings a ray of sunshine to our Friday morning, which is wonderful too. Uh, Lucy is joining us uh, from Bayes. Welcome, Lucy. And, and she's the first to say that she's here primarily for a listening brief, but it's really valuable, I think, for Bayes to tap into the mid-market, which is most of the audience today, uh, because that's often the hardest place for policymakers to access. And I know obviously yours truly doing what I do. So before we move into the actual panel session and hearing from the panel, I'm just going to quickly talk you through last week's poll and just kind of take you through some of, the, not all the slides because there were a fair number, uh, they're now more beautiful, not just the Zoom thing you may have seen last week. Um, so the first one we looked at was who was responsible. This is an innovation, sort of what you might call um, maturity exercise. So who's responsible? And if you take the the firm-wide leader and you take the 15% uh, C-suite, you're talking about 56% being responsible for somebody at that level. And that's fine. I'm a little bit concerned that 13% have no one responsible for driving innovation. I suspect they're not very innovative firms, but that's another story. Um, quickly here, the blue is when the managing partner is responsible and the red is when somebody else is responsible. And it's kind of clear to me that the blues are over to the right so that when people think about their firm, if the leader is driving innovation, then they feel that firm is, is, is more, is closer is to, the good, to a good place in innovation terms. Um, there's various statements here. I won't go through them all in any depth, but the one that was particularly picked up uh, last week was the one at, towards the bottom where we said, we have a fully documented innovation strategy, 5% uh, to 12%. Now, again, there are two arguments here. Some people say that innovation is, should be just allowed to flourish. Other would say it should have a strategy behind it. Uh, even if whatever you sit on that particular spectrum, the fact that firms seem to have no strategy for innovation, I think is probably holding them back. And equally, if you go through this page, and again, there's a lot on here, but it's all on the website, you can find it all. Um, there's very few people who have defined processes for innovation, uh, very few people who have defined funds or budget for innovation. So there is a, an own, so there's quite a lot of things which probably uh, could be better, I think is probably the elegant way of putting it. Uh, what, what does that mean? Well, Louise is here around productivity, so I'm sure she'll be pleased to see the top one, saying that productivity is positively impacted by um, innovation. And then, and then you can obviously deep read down the rest. But uh, we're talking, again, quite a lot about talent today. So again, that's quite low. Uh, but when the managing partner is responsible, then it's higher from 15 to 42. So clearly, of all of them, the one where I think the managing partner driving innovation has most impact is around the talent uh, attraction and retention agenda. And finally, what are people actually doing about it? And again, these are all really low numbers, which is a bit depressing. Incubators, five, 10%, crowdsourcing, 10%, whatever it is. Uh, the only one that seems to get sort of uh, more is partnering for innovation. But again, firms find it hard to partner unless the leader's behind it. So that's probably just stating the obvious innovation teams again higher numbers if the managing partner's responsible. There's more slides um, in the, in the um, as I said, in the, excuse me, um, collaborative zone. So uh, just to remind us why we do these polls, this is feedback uh, from government and uh, I will continue to use it as long as it's true, but hopefully it is. Uh, your poll results are incredibly valuable in analysis during these dynamic times. So thank you for government for feed that to us. We, 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 we want to help you is the honest answer. And this I think is a really good way to, to, to feel we can do that. So uh, today's poll, what I'm gonna do today is um, ask you to complete the monthly tracker. Now, We've done this one a number of times before. Uh, I think this is pretty much, I used to do it every six months and now it's kind of every month. Uh, and this one got into the Daily Telegraph last time we ran it a month ago. So it has definitely got a very big audience. Okay, that's uh, probably good. We've got lots of you completed it. So that's fantastic. So the polls just ended. So let's share the results. So what are we saying? Uh, the one that comes up top is increased operational efficiency. And I know from a month ago, that was also a top. And looking through here now, develop a clear purpose and strategy is quite high. Skills and capabilities has crept up from last time. Increased use of tech has dropped back a bit, but they're all, those are the top four. So that's quite useful. 
Uh, we're still looking at about a 20% dip in income of the firm over the next 12 months. Um, obviously, there's not too many above 20%, but that's the sort of the one that's attracted most of them. Uh, there's a modest contraction expected over the level of activity, but a few with some expansion, 25% with expansion. That wasn't there certainly a month ago, so that's quite positive, I suspect, for government. Um, in terms of the, the new work, uh, so again, modest contraction, but modest expansion, almost the same number. That's different. That was not the case a month ago. And even when we're looking at headcount, again, we're seeing some expansion, and that was certainly single figures in the past. So, so my take from those three or four is that the sector is slightly more buoyant than they thought they would be a month ago. And that, that's obviously really good to know. In terms of the uh, what proportion of people are likely to be still working from home at the end of October, which as you will know is when the furlough scheme comes to an end, around three quarters and a half of the two kind of major ones. Uh, very few people with everybody, and uh, but equally nobody with no one. So I think we can say that everybody's expecting their offices to be open by the end of October. Uh, how are people feeling about it? Well, apprehensive, I think, is still very strong. Uh, so there's a big management issue there. As to how do you balance the apprehension of your people with a clear message that the office will be open and if so, who will be in the office? Uh, in terms of office space, again, that's now seems to be upping and downing, but very few more, about the same as the biggest, but there's still quite a few people who are going a much bigger proportion, nearly 60% are, are using less. So uh, obviously when you cut it that way, it makes it slightly less helpful. Uh, what proportion of staff are currently fur furloughed? Uh, the answer there is 10%, and, but come the extension period, none is now the one that is the highest uh, on that one particular one, and none was the 31%, it's gone to 45%. So from the extension period, it looks like firms are going to be using it less. So I think that's probably about enough for the poll. Hopefully that's helpful to, to Lucy and government. We'll obviously give you the, the details once I've had a chance to make them look beautiful. Uh, so at which point I will now stop sharing and I will also stop sharing my screen and I will invite uh, Marian to come and tell us a bit about his six weeks since he was last on the show with us. Uh, thanks very much indeed, Richard. Some very interesting findings there. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope everyone is well. Uh, and I hope everyone has now dispensed with the, uh, as you go through these difficult times terminology, because this seems to be part and parcel of the way that we now live. Um, as Richard said, the last time I was on here was about six weeks ago. For those who don't know me, I'm a coach. I work extensively with partners and partner teams, uh, predominantly in law firms, but other professional services firms too. I'm just going to allude briefly to the changes that I've perceived over the last 15 weeks or so since this thing started. Um, when I first uh, was engaging with my, my clients, my coaches at the start of this process, it was very much around tactical topics. It was around how are we going to sustain our client relationships? What are we going to do in business development terms since we can't actually physically network anymore? What can we do to tell our clients that we love them? How can we continue that outreach? And that was the predominant theme, I'd say, for the first three or four weeks. Then as the uh, lockdown started to intensify, the serious ramifications really started to embed. It then moved on to a question of resilience. Uh, how are we going to sustain our energy levels? How are we going to stay motivated? How are we going to communicate with our teams and make sure that there's a high level of motivation and uh, continued um, sense of mission? Um, that then led into communication. How do we communicate properly as leaders? Now what I'm really perceiving is a very clear trend to the question of how are we going to lead change? How are we going to embed whatever this new normal is? And I suspect that there never will be a new normal. There will be a continued process of uh, accommodation for uh, continually changing circumstances. That will be the new normal. So how are we going to think and behave agilely? How are we going to maintain a common purpose in rapidly changing, evolving, continually uncertain times. And uh, <clears throat> this has been a, a really big issue. Uh, one of the joys of actually um, being self-employed is that I've had a lot of time to do other things like play the guitar 
and celebrate Liverpool becoming champions of the Premier League for the first time in 30 years. And uh, I was listening to a podcast about uh, Klopp's steps towards achieving the successes of the team. And one of the key games um, that led to this was a two-all draw with West Brom soon after he uh, took over as the manager. And it wasn't the game itself at all. It was a fairly undistinguished game. But what he did for the first time was at the end of the game, he led his entire team to the cop end and stood and embraced the cop, celebrated their presence, and uh, effectively started to create something which Richard had just talked about as well, a conversion into a community. Um, Klopp's point up to that was that um, the uh, Anfield supporters felt that Liverpool was there simply to deliver success and to provide them entertainment. And when that wasn't happening, they would leave the ground early. And embracing those, uh, uh, the, the audience, the spectators, at the end, by acknowledging that their sustained commitment, he was effectively undertaking a contract um, with the fans. And the fans, in turn, were encouraged to embrace a contract with the uh, team. I think this is such a critical point. Um, Richard talked about client listening. Uh, I think that client listening is terrific, but I think a critical point going forward in this change leadership is to find a way of adapting this clock mentality to creating a much deeper, stronger, sustained, transparent sense of community between stakeholders, particularly between clients and the firm. And of course, between teams within the firm to create a much greater sense of trust, to create a much greater sense of common purpose. So what I'm seeing is a, a very welcome uh, Venn diagram between my Liverpool support and the kind of direction of travel that a lot of uh, team leaders and managing partners are now starting to take. And I'm delighted that Nigel's here today as well to talk about this from a learning and development perspective. And um, one final thing, Klopp speaks about speaking with emotions. He is emotionally accessible. He is a, not afraid to be vulnerable, to share his weaknesses as well as his strengths. That is the cornerstone of his management and leadership style, the cornerstone of his success. I think, personally, that's a real challenge for leaders in our sector. And it's a kind of gauntlet that I would like to lay down and perhaps explore and to discuss further. Anyway, Richard, back to you. I'm impressed you managed to bring football into our session. That's fantastic because, of course, yeah, you have the, the football manager. And one key thing about the football manager is they don't actually play the game. They're always going to be on the sidelines. And that's quite frustrating in a way. On which happy note, at least the managing partner is on the team. So, uh, Louise, come and tell us about Rebuild and Be The Business. Really looking forward to it. Thanks, Richard. And uh, delighted to be here. And I have to start with I know very little about football. Um, so uh, uh, Be The Business, uh, as I hope uh, you know, is uh, effectively an independent charity backed by government and uh, the private sector. And we have a real focus on small and medium sized businesses and firm level recovery and productivity. Um, I just want to talk to you firstly about some insight that really resonates with the poll that's just been run um, and uh, what's uh, been talked about, about the shape that we're finding uh, the economy. Um, talk to you about Rebuild and our campaign Toolkit for Recovery and then finish on basically how I think this can help both uh, you and your clients. Uh, so first, you just touched on a bit of uh, insight and uh, what we've heard over the last three months. And it's a dynamic and changing position, um, as you will all resonate with. So at the beginning of lockdown, we worked very closely with SMEs to understand what's really happening day to day from a leadership perspective and the challenges that people are facing. Um, we came through this at the beginning with effectively kind of four groups of the way that businesses were being affected by what was happening. Uh, businesses that were hibernating, um, closing their business, following staff, survivors um, that were just keeping things going, people who were pivoting um, and changing their business models, and then thrivers who were actually coming through this and seeing some real opportunity. Um, again, no doubt you'll have seen this with your clients and with some of the experiences that you're having. Uh, more recently, as we start to restart the economy, um, we're seeing some changes happening. And again, this resonates with the poll just run. Um, so in the, 
we've seen businesses have done effectively three years of innovation in three months. So the, it's unprecedented times. We're seeing real change and quite rapidly. Um, businesses are really adapting and adopting technology at a higher rate than before. Um, I have to say, not always successfully. Um, and many of us will have had our challenges with uh, many of these types of calls. Um, scarring is a real fear. Um, as we come out of the uh, lockdown um, and many businesses actually are fearing that they won't actually come back and bounce back with a turnover until 2022 or later, which is quite fundamental. Um, so from this, we're seeing groups emerging where we've got innovators, um, where people are really continuing to innovate and really driving that change. Um, stickers. Um, where people tend to be confident and are sticking with their models and then a third of businesses who are actually just holding back because they're not quite ready to commit to change at the moment. So we've responded by a campaign called Rebuild and Toolkit which uh, we've stood up. So Rebuild is all about recovery and helping businesses to recover. We're re very passionate about productivity being a core part of this. So firstly we've got an online tool um, that looks over six areas, again that resonates with the poll that you've run, around business models, employees, finance, leadership, suppliers and technology. Um, secondly, um, we're bringing leaders together from all different businesses, shapes and sizes to collaborate. So trust, peer-to-peer -peer action, working with mentors, problem-solving groups is all really resonating with people as people start to share experiences. Um, we've also got a big campaign that we'll be running with Facebook, which is actually doing virtual roadshows, regional roadshows, which I'd encourage you to join and be part of um, to share what we're learning and what's actually happening. So thirdly, what's this mean for you? What opportunity is there? Um, it's free resource, firstly, which is uh, always attractive. Um, so please access it, have a look as Richard said, um, use it yourselves, use it with your clients. Um, get involved. We are actively looking for mentors. Um, we are actively encouraging you to put forward your clients for mentees. Um, sign up to the leadership activities that are there. We work with lots of different partnerships to make sure we're evolving and accessible with what's available and relevant for today. Um, and please, please, please read the insights. Tell us what you're hearing. Uh, we are looking at your polls, we're looking at other information to make sure that actually we are helping businesses to really restart at what is a very difficult time. Thanks, Richard. Wonderful. Well, um, community came back strongly there, I think. So <laughs> that certainly is the theme that I picked up from Marion. And I think the community that <clears throat> you and obviously Tony Danko, who is probably knows is about to take over at the CBI, which is amazing. So uh, congratulations to him for that. And uh, thank you very much for that uh, very tight five minute presentation. On which happy note, Nigel, come and tell us perhaps a little bit more internally about L&D, but maybe that's about building internal communities and peer groups. Who knows? Let's find out. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Richard. Thank you uh, for inviting me to be here this morning. Um, well, it will be, but I'm also going to talk externally because I'm going to pick up one of Marion's themes as well, actually, about clients. Um, so, um, yeah, been in learning development for, for many years in, in law firms, also was a PwC before that, Sophia, and for about seven years, so across professional services. Um, and Richard has asked me to pick out a few trends of, you know, using L&D wisely. Um, I guess what I would say is that I think some of these are acceleration points. So things that actually were happening a little bit already that, that has been accelerated, going back to the three years of innovation in three months that you just mentioned, uh, Francesca, as well. So um, I think, yeah, uh, sorry, Louise, uh, that Louise mentioned. So I think that point is, is dead on. So some acceleration points and a few new things. So I'm just going to pick out five points just very briefly. So I'll literally try and keep to a minute a point. Um, one is around, for me, is around the need to develop broader skill sets. Um, and so if we're thinking of how do we use L&D wisely, I think, you know, there are two levels to this for me. There's one at almost a firm-wide level, because we know firms are reshaping. There's all the macro picture. Firms are deciding, do we build or buy capability? You know, we know that some of the acquisitions that have happened the last few years where some professional service firms have got together with tech businesses, acquired them to build in the extra skill sets that clients are wanting. So there's a macro thought there of how do we support that work in L&D, I think. And then more at an individual level, I think, an interesting point around almost building extensions to skill sets. And one thing I'm seeing in almost every conversation where you know, I've been involved with, whether it's about uh, virtual vacation schemes or it's about working with senior partners, you know, we used to 
we used to give lots of guidance and L and D programs around managing, um, managing and delegating. Whether it was almost about how you drive motivation in your team, but almost the extension, how did you create a great work product for the client? All the things about supervising and creating that uh, that service delivery for clients. Now, of course, there's that extra dimension of how do I do that when my team's all scattered and I'm not seeing them, I'm not bumping into them in the corridor. They're not seeing the, um, they're not almost seeing the, the, beha the, the behaviors, they're not um, being able to pick up on all the, um, all the learning from the calls by observing so much. Um, so for me, there's almost that thought of extending skill sets at an individual level. So how's L&D in your firm actually thinking about that extension of skill sets to, to help, as you say, Marion, be more agile going forward? And if we also think of just briefly of that thought of adult development being around the 70, 20, 10 balance of 70% being through on the job experience, 20% being we learn from each other. So that's the mentoring, the buddying, the coaching, and 10% being through formal learning programs. I guess the challenge therefore becomes for 90% of that 100%, that's all around the on the job experience and the um, and the budding, the mentoring, it's all around the connection. So how do we achieve that in this current, current world and in the agile world, as you said, Marion, that, that, we, that we look forward to? Second point, and Marion, this comes back to your clients, I'm gonna go externally here, Richard. And it's that thought of, I would say, the wise firms I've seen are keeping their learning function really close to the client aspect of the firm and the external world at the moment. How are we linking the client feedback into, into the what's and all that knowledge of what clients are wanting and will want in the future into the learning and development work in the firm? Um, and also how are we sitting with clients as well? Some firms are doing some great, you know, have done for a few years actually, but some firms keeping really close to clients. You know, they, they, they run little learning forums where their senior leaders sit with their clients. It might be around doing scenario planning, which I know is a theme you've lived, looked at on the forum here. So how are you actually bringing your learning work really closely to the client world would, would, would be my, one, of, one of my thoughts there. And I guess that links back, Marianne, to your other point of agility, because how are we getting the agility into the learning agenda? We perhaps used to having competencies and we'd set up competency frameworks and we'd run learning programs around those. But you know, we've seen the last few years how firms have moved from say, annual appraisals to ongoing feedback. So that thought of agility in the whole HR system in the firm, how are we doing that from a learning point of view as well? Perhaps building around some core skills, which may be around being agile of thought, having more uh, skills around design thinking, not being so, you know, being more flexible in my approach. All of those more broad skills, the problem solving, the creativity. So if we're building perhaps a more agile learning and development uh, agenda, um, are we focusing on that um, going forward as well? Third trend I'd pick out is, and this is more of a, a learning, uh, uh, kind of a, in the learning and development sector that people have been talking about the last few years, moving from creating to curating. And what do I mean by that? Well, I'll just tell a very brief story. EY a few years ago, and this is, you know, they sort of talked about this externally a lot. EY, they noticed that not only were they running some great uh, L&D programs for their staff, but they noticed that people were going outside the firm increasingly. Um, because people's career paths were changing, the skill sets they needed to build were becoming more flexible. People were saying, ah, well, just in time, I need really some, um, I need really some, uh, I need some extra skills. So how do I build those? And they would notice they were going outside and buying and buying some little programs themselves. So the L&D agenda in the future, people are increasingly saying, needs to be about creating an ecosystem for people in the firm. So yes, we, we do have some core induction programs, perhaps as people step up levels, but almost, how do we almost allow them that ecosystem to dip into learning when they need it as well? And I suppose just one other thought as well in terms of, uh, so my, my fourth trend was all around, actually what have we learned from the last few weeks is actually some of the tech methods, going back to Louise's point, some of those can be really, 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 um, can be really effective because what it's encouraged I think is more little and often learning because we've had to break down learning programs because we can't be on zoom all day so people have broken down learning programs and I think that is a really helpful that's a really helpful method because it goes back Marion to your coaching as well where you intersperse coaching with some learning programs so people can break down what does that mean for me in my practice and apply it to themselves um, and just lastly Richard to end as you say the thought around creating glue in the firm Learning always had that role, I think, of creating glue in the firm, creating between peer groups around the different offices or the different departments in a firm or different floors of the building, perhaps. So how are we doing that, I think, needs to be part of the learning agenda in a more agile way. Um, so that's probably, Richard, what, what I would end on. And I would link that to back to the board agendas as well, because 
I think what we've noticed with the bald agendas is, you know, corporate responsibility, carbon footprint. People are saying, I'm not going to fly people all around the world for, for board meetings, for partner meetings. But that also goes for learning as well. So if we're not going to be able to physically gather, how do we continue to create that glue in the firm? I guess, Richard, would be one of my, one of my questions to end with. So I hope that's been a bit of a, a journey through uh, four or five themes there um, of how I'm seeing learning um, changing, how people I think are using learning wisely. But for me, as you, Richard, I think it is a bit of an external thought as well about how we're keeping close to clients in learning. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, they always say that um, there's one thing you can be sure about in life is that you'd never win an argument with a client. You might think you've won it, but they have a, have a horrible habit of going away. So, uh, on which happy note, Jonathan, please come and tell us a little bit about where you're seeing life in terms of retuning the firm to make sure the right number of people are at the right level uh, across the firm. Richard, thank you and uh, welcome. Hello, everybody. Nice to be here with you. Um, just a tiny bit of background on me. I spent uh, the better part of 25 years in a professional services firm, uh, including most of that as a partner. And I've now spent the last 20 years coaching people in and around uh, professional services firms. So um, that's where I'm coming to this from. Um, <clears throat> I came across an expression uh, a few weeks ago uh, of something called the Corona Stone, which those uh, fitness and health conscious friends of mine told me was the pounds that most of us have been piling on during the lockdown without really noticing. Uh, and my question really to you today is, has your firm put on a Corona Stone, perhaps without noticing it during lockdown? And if so, what might you do about that? Um, I'm pretty clear, both from my own experience and from talking to all the people I talk to now, that it's a key part of every uh, business leader, every firm leader, to keep an eye on the right weight for their firm, the right shape, the right weight. And from time to time, we avoid getting on the scales and having a look and seeing uh, whether we are where we think we are. But every now and again, I think we should do it. And part of this retuning idea that Richard's uh, bringing to you all uh, in this new episode, I think could involve putting your firm on the scales and, and seeing how it sits. And by that, I mean things like the balance between your fee earning and perhaps your non fee earning staff, the shape of the pyramid that you've got at the top of which you're looking for your new partners. Uh, and of course, critically, the shape of your partnership group itself, the demographic spread across it uh, and who you've got coming in, who you've got in the middle, or who you've got perhaps beginning to look to retirement and whether they will or not. Now, different firms will have different ideas about what's right for them, uh, but we all should have a view about it. Uh, one of the key things I think also is that your people can see that your firm provides opportunities for growth, development and promotion. One of the key motivators that we see and hear about all the time in the people we're, we're working with is, where can I go in this place? What, what opportunities does it present for me? And if the room ahead looks a bit clogged or crowded, that can be quite a strong reason why people leave and sometimes why the wrong people leave. Because again, this thing about right shaping is not just having the right numbers of people, but having the right people stay and dare I say it, the right people uh, leave. Um, so we're all operating an, an escalator and that escalator in normal times works pretty well because there is a natural level of staff turnover, uh, there are promotions, there are retirements, the, 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 the process works. And on the whole that process has begun to work better in the last few years I think than it did. One of the few benefits I think that came out of the global financial crisis was that a lot of people managing their teams and their people got better at what one might call actively managing levels and numbers of people rather than perhaps the old school that I was brought up with where you just sort of expected it to happen. Many more honest conversations take place, many more conversations taking an active interest in people's careers both positively and sometimes less so but in order to help maintain the shape and and flow of the firm now covid has thrown quite a few spanners in the works of this escalator it's not working as smoothly as it did all sorts of things have gone on um, hiring freezes uh, 
investment collapses leading to pension pots looking much smaller and people thinking, whoops, I, I can't retire for another few years when I thought perhaps I might be going to. Uh, promotions are being put on hold. Remote working, there's been quite a lot of talk about that this morning already, and that is making those really important, honest conversations, regular conversations, catch-ups, less easy. And people, while they're managing in a crisis, as they have been, duck some of these things. They slip down the agenda. Some of the important, necessary, but perhaps not vital and urgent issues are, are slipping off the agenda. That the effect of all this, I think, has been to slow down the escalator and clog up the works, probably, for a lot of firms. Were they, therefore, now to get on the scales again and have a good look at themselves, I think you might find that the shape isn't where it might be. And that even before you start looking at downturns in work. Uh, so I think it's a very good time for us all to be having a careful look at uh, shape and, and what we would like to be. Now, by like to be, again, just to repeat the point, this isn't just about overall payroll. This isn't just numbers. This is about having the right talents and energies and numbers of people in the right places, uh, all up and down the firm and in the front office and in the back office. Now, uh, in, in some firms, this is different depending on size, but it's a point that I think is worth active scrutiny. And coming back to Richard's point about this is time to stop and think about strategy. This, I think, is absolutely a core element of, of strategy. Now, once you've got to the point of identifying what the size should be, what are the things you should do about it? And I think this is going to be somewhere where probably Marianne and I are going to be singing from the same sheet because there's an awful lot here about relationship and honest conversations. Having the right kind of honest conversations, making sure that your managers do speak to people honestly and openly about them and their career aspirations and their goals and where they want to go and how they think they're going to get there and charging your people with some responsibility for that then provides a platform from which conversations can take place, the result of which is you keep and promote and develop effectively the people you want to keep and promote and develop. And just as importantly, you can have a conversation without it necessarily being highly charged with those people for whom it might be right either now or soon to move on. And you can engage with them in that process and help them do that. And this is a, this is a cultural shift for many firms, but it's a really important one to try and achieve. And as a leader, it's about enabling and upskilling your managers and holding them accountable for having the conversations that you've equipped them to be able to have. Secondly, there will, of course, be some redundancies. That's going to happen. The redundancies, it used to be thought, would be ghastly and catastrophic culturally for almost all professional services firms. Again, the crisis showed that that needn't be the case. If you do them well, that doesn't have to happen. One point I'd make about redundancies is it is often tempting to look at voluntary schemes because it seems somehow kinder and gentler and easier. The problem with a voluntary scheme, of course, is that you're not the one who chooses who goes. And again, if you're talking about right sizing, that can sometimes be less than the ideal outcome. And the third and last group I'm going to mention, where, of course, most of the cost lies, and if that's what you've got your eye on, are the partners. Now, having conversations with partners about their progression and development, again, when I was brought up in this profession, really didn't happen. Fortunately, now it is beginning to. It's happening more and it's happening better. But driving further cultural change within your partnership so that those conversations can and do take place is the solution to those sticky partners later on in their careers who are getting in the way of the younger blood that you want to give more equity points to and bring further up the ladder. So shifting that conversational skill set and that culture around it is, is the goal there. So coming back to it all, I think it is time to get on the scales, to have a look at where we are and what's going on. I completely agree with Marion that it's no good any longer to say we're waiting for afterwards. I think we've arrived at afterwards. Afterwards is what we're in now. And the uncertainties that we are facing aren't going to go away. This is going to be an uncertain world. The one certain thing, 
I say, is that if you don't get on the scales and don't have a look at yourself, you might find you've piled on some pounds that you don't want and that it's going to get increasingly hard to move them unless you start doing something about it soon. So that's my thought about the Corona Stone and professional services firms. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, what I'll do, I think, Francesca, if you want to come in now, we've kind of got about 10 minutes or so. We'll perhaps we'll, we'll move into more of a panel session, just give you a chance to mention a few things and I'll bring the others in if that's okay. And Lucy, please do join us as well as part of that panel session. Yeah, sure, Richard. Let's uh, let's kick off. I mean, gosh, thank you everybody for those comments and I, insight. And there's a whole there's a whole thematic going on there, isn't there, about what, things that we're still doing that we were doing before, um, but doing them but completely differently. And and I think there's a little touch in there of doing some things that we weren't doing before as well. But it, it's intriguing how a lot of what we're talking about is stuff that we were already had in train and we're refreshing it. Uh, or renewing it and uh, going back to Louisa's point about are we rebuilding it um, let me just throw in some thoughts and then love to hear what other people got to say uh, along that and um, the whole piece around the leadership journey during these times is is just utterly fascinating isn't it I mean how do we how do we become the leaders we need to be in times of massive change and I know we've been running a, a global program around that over the last couple of weeks where a, a lot of those themes that we've been talking about today resilience um, having honest conversations over a different type of technology have come to the fore. And uh, in the old days, when you were talking to people on the telephone back in the 1980s, uh, we all used to play the, oh, the signal's gone, didn't we? Now we play, oh, my Wi-Fi is a bit weak uh, in terms of dodging some of those difficult conversations. So particularly good uh, to listen to what Jonathan was saying about you can't use that as an excuse not to have the conversations you need to have. And there's an honesty and an authenticity about it that's very powerful. Also, people expect you to tell them what's really going on. So I think there's a there's a real challenge to, to all of the leaders that are on this call about how you make sure that you don't wait till you're back in the office to have the kind of conversations you know you need to have. We have all seen who in our teams have risen to the top like cream uh, during the last few months and those who've really struggled. And will that does that mean that they will also struggle? when we get uh, into, the, into the next iteration of our world. And, and what, why are they struggling? Is it, the, is it they need a different skill set? Do they need support? Do they need help? Or is it actually um, a whole bunch of things are going on that they, they are going to feel that they're just, that's not the world that they're gonna be um, so successful in. So those honesty of conversations. Uh, two more things for me, Richard. I love the Corona Stone. Uh, analogy. I'm rather alarmed that it might be more than a stone in some cases, but uh, that it is a piece around not just sitting back and waiting for something miraculously to happen. It's you have to take stock of it now. And I know we've been having um, sort of conversations looking at the objectives that, we, you know, we quite traditionally we set objectives in January. Well, a lot of those objectives look completely ridiculous now. Um, they're predicated in the world that's long since gone. So, you know, how are you organising yourself for the rest of the year? What really matters? And we've been talking a lot about rather than having sort of mythical six month objectives uh, when nobody really knows what October is going to look like. Uh, what about 100 day objectives, rolling objectives, ones that you're truly thinking about, driving about something that's very practical and that's right here and right now and then a slightly longer term. And as we've mentioned a couple of times on these calls, longer term feels quite near these days. Longer term might be three, three months or six months. So that's another piece I think is worth thinking through. And then last but not least, on the L&D piece, no, hugely important that that L&D continues. And, and two things that really resonated for me, um, when you've moved your, your L&D to a digital format, little and often just feels so right. Uh, I was running some regional meetings, which traditionally we'd have done over two and a half days of full on meetings. And you can't possibly replicate that digitally. Everyone would lose the world to live. And it's just such a painful process. So we did it in little two hour chunks and uh, we could move people into workshops and have breakouts and we could whiteboard. The tech's amazing these days to help with that. But that just felt really helpful to, to, to think about. You don't need to replicate a big chunk of time. You can do it in little stages. And you might want to do a stage one week and a stage the next week. And, and, and for us, it's often about different time zones as well, which really helps. Um, so last thing then from that L and D was, was also, it's really encouraging to hear what Nigel was saying and what others have saying is they haven't stopped 
the L&D isn't stopping. People are appreciating that in the current world, it's really important that we don't make the mistakes that you might have seen in the past, where the L&D team were the one that got cut or reduced or the budget disappeared. Um, in times like this, you've never need learning more. And it's really encouraging to hear people still committed to investing in that. Thanks, Francesca. We've got a couple of questions, uh, which again, um, Jonathan's point, this is one for anonymous attendee, Jonathan's point about conversation for partners, linked redundancies, what would you suggest are the basic criteria to have such conversations? That's the first question. And the other one, again, I'm not sure this is addressed at any particular panel member well, from John, this is we're talking about skill set change, but how much of the change is more around comms and the move from local to face to face? Uh, local face to face to remote. In other words, is it a comms issue or is it a skills issue or are we talking about comms skill? I suppose I'm trying to mix the two for a second. But Marion, do you want to perhaps pick up the comms one and then we'll come back to Jonathan on the conversations, if I may? I would say that communications is a, a critical skill. It's a critical skill for a leader or a parent or a football manager or anyone. And it's a skill which is often underdeveloped. Uh, one of my coaching client says that his team describe him as Father Christmas. And the reason they do that is because he will give them what he thinks they want, rather than have the conversations with them that he judges that they need. It goes partly back to Jonathan's issue about having critical conversations. Critical conversations is both a skill and a mindset. Uh, it's the ability to structure a conversation in a way to use language in a way, to have a kind of inquisitive mindset in a way which elicits reflective thinking on the other, from the other, gets your point over in a way that does not sound confrontational or critical, but nonetheless objectively sets out what your agenda is and sets out an agenda for change. There's a lot of complexity in that. That's just communication uh, in one sense, but in another sense, it's a, a critical uh, structural part of leadership. And I think it needs to be um, developed. I think it needs learning and developers. It needs coaches to help people to get better at it. And it needs to be practiced. And I actually think that this kind of format, Zoom, is a wonderful means of doing that. Because unlike when we're sitting in meetings, looking out of windows or finding all sorts of other distractions, the kind of Zoom video conference is a much more distilled intensive means of practicing effective communication. So for me, this is a terrific silver lining. Great, uh, Jonathan, and I know that uh, Nigel had a couple of thoughts on this one as well. So over to you, sir, Jonathan. Yeah, discussions about people and their not being part of a firm anymore raise all sorts of emotional uh, issues for both parties. Uh, and often there's a, there's a concern because loyalties build up over time and firms, big and small, actually, are, are communities and contain often quite intimate communities of people, uh, even as subgroups. So thinking for yourself about what's going on for you emotionally about the conversation that you're going to be having and a bit about what's going on for the other person, I think are really important preparatory steps. And also uh, being aware of which is which and, and not letting too much of what you're concerned about and anxious about getting in the way. Um, often these conversations need to be kept uh, simple and short and also be kept to a point where you recognise they're not going to be a single conversation. That there's often a, a, a series of them that needs to take place. People take time to distill and absorb difficult information and give themselves time to react. And then I think I come back to Richard's favourite topic of the moment of listening uh, and that actually the key thing when we're having a conversation about which we may feel slightly awkward is not to rush into it, deliver what we want to deliver and make for the door as fast as we can. The key thing is to say what you need to say and give the other person a chance to be heard or possibly even to start off with a question rather than a statement and draw them into the conversation that way. So yeah, this, as Marion's been suggesting, is a massive and complex and, and nuanced subject about having difficult conversations um, and uh, that's just a few quick thoughts about it. 
Thanks. There's also a neuroscience to aspect of that in the sense that the, the brain is very good at switching off the moment it hears, it hears bad news. So if you come in and give the bad news, uh, you must have stopped the conversation there. It's actually a much more complex context in which you need to be sharing that information. Otherwise, you're just talking to somebody who, even if they pretend to, is not listening to you because they're thinking about the consequences of the bad news on them. Because as we all know, the future is about the present in terms of how you perceive the future, if that's not a contradiction in terms. Nigel, over to you, sir. Yeah, it was, it was just to expand on a thought uh, from Marin and Jonathan there, really, that I think, and to, to answer the question you say about the communication point, I think it's that point of under stress, we often go back to our preferences. Many people are very task focused. So Jonathan, to your point of actually where do you aim the conversation is I've got this thing to get across to someone. Rather, actually, where do we know about what do we know about building trust? It's about focusing on the other premise of coaching other person's agenda so actually we need to start the other person's agenda so for me it's a mindset point actually in terms of the remote communication it's about being proactive with the team it's about reaching out as i was saying you know if it's about in this with your team scattered it's about being proactive and checking in more regularly and saying okay how is this how is this this thing i delegated to you going or whether it's about promotion or whatever the jonathan as you were saying all those issues that may be quite complicated emotionally to deal with so it's about focusing on the other, I would say, first of all, start from that mindset, whether it's a client or it's your key team member, start from there, ask questions, as you say, Jonathan, and actually get, get the other person talking, hear their perspective first. That for me, so it, for me, it's about being proactive, but actually starting with the other person. So, thanks, Nigel. Um, Lucy and Louise, I haven't really had a chance to sort of bring you into this conversation. I know we're kind of coming close to that uh, sadly that 10 o'clock deadline, but is there anything, Louise, that you want to sort of share based on participating in this group today? Yeah, I think uh, just one thing that really resonates is the fact that, you know, we are facing um, real change and actually we're all experiencing the same sort of experience as leaders. So actually it doesn't matter what size firm you're in, um, the sectors you're in, these challenges are facing all of us. So, you know, really working together and sharing with others. Um, I think it's really important to build those communities and be part of them. Um, so that's really resonated with a lot of people that we're hearing from. Uh, it's that's great. I mean, let, when everyone is thinking alike, hopefully it's not groupthink, but that's another story. Uh, uh, what I'll probably do now, if I may, is I will shift to our final couple of slides just to remind people but obviously thank the panel for all their uh, uh, very hard work because believe me to say they always say I'm sorry this letter's so long I didn't have time to write you a short one and actually distilling your whole focus and everything into five minutes is is very challenging so thank you all for making that massive effort and I thought we've really covered a huge amount of territory and the thing about retuning is of course that um, there's any number of issues that the management could be looking at and the risk I always think, though, is that if management, in a sense, only thinks about its agenda, there's a massive problem which is called cascading. Because if you don't actually work out how to take an idea from that strategic conversation and work it down within the organization in a way that people who are not dealing in aggregates as management do, but are actually dealing in sort of the data itself and bit of a disconnect there quite frankly at times so the whole issue around how do you cascade knowledge down in the organization is something I think we'll pick up in in future sessions because I think it's something that people kind of think oh the management team's going to talk about it that's great well yeah if you've ever been in a, an organization at a lower level and the management has a conversation well, a you don't probably know about it and b you probably don't hear about what emerged because it's not certain what may happen in the future or some such reason and I think there's a lot of stuff there that we could all work on so let's just remind ourselves all the videos, uh, as I said, will, are in the management library. Um, and now whether this is episode one or episode 16, it's your call, I don't really mind, um, but we're gonna continue running them. And um, I think the retune uh, theme does work and I've, I'm really pleased about that. Thank you, Myron, for inspiring us at the outset. I said to me, I'm not really sure I've got anything to talk about. And believe me, everybody is coming back to your key themes. So therein lies, so thank you, sir. And thank you, Jonathan, for your uh, great insight around the Corona Stone. I think we're all putting on weight without in the without realizing it as the elevator slows down. Thank you, Francesca, as always, for your, your ray of sunshine. And thank you for bringing us the, those great takes. 
and of course to Nigel for reminding us that L and D there's more to L and D than running training courses. So I'm afraid management sadly doesn't always see it that way. Uh, Louise, thank you for your um, be the business, and we definitely look forward to working with you and as, as much as we can to support that initiative because I think it's great that you know if at the end of the day if we support our clients and we help them. Well, they may be then clients in the future. If they go out of business, dot, 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 then we don't have any clients. So it's, it's not totally altruistic. On which happy note, I will, as I said, hope you found today valuable and please encourage people to sign up. It's exactly the same link as before. That's the beauty of Zoom. You can change things, a bit like a LinkedIn where you can change the name of your group. And please consider supporting our work by joining the forum. And that's something that we're obviously eager to talk to you about. And I know Claire will be in touch with some of you over the next week or two. So thank you again today. Thank you for a wonderful panel. And I think we've made a really good start to Retune. But believe me, Retune is going to be around for a little bit longer to go, I think, onwards and upwards. So thank you very much and wish you all a wonderful day. Bye for now.